Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the last week on the beat of the Vatican and the global Catholic Church. And as ever, a great deal to talk about this week. We are going to begin with more furor over fiducia. So the Vatican's December 18th declaration authorizing, under certain circumstances, non-liturgical blessings of same-sex unions continues to generate reaction, consternation, controversy, and debate all around the world. We will bring you the latest, trying to break down who is saying what and what it all means. Second up this week, we've got a year of yellow. So the Italian word giallo, which literally means yellow, is also their term for a mystery story. The greatest Vatican mystery of recent times involves the so-called Vatican girl, that is, the disappearance in 1983 of a 15-year-old girl by the name of Emanuela Orlandi, who lived in an apartment with her family on Vatican grounds because her dad worked for the Vatican. And there is every indication that 2024 is going to be a year in which this particular giallo, that is, this particular mystery story, is very much front and center in terms of public attention. We'll explain why that is and what we might expect. Third up this week, we've got of popes and polls. So a new Gallup poll in the United States finds that while Pope Francis's favorability rating, both overall among Americans and also with American Catholics, are high enough that they would be the envy of most politicians and celebrities in the country. Nevertheless, his unfavorability ratings in the United States are also at an all-time high. We'll try to explain what that is and what, why that is, rather, and what the significance of it might be. And then finally, this week, we've got Wither the Weather. So there is an Italian phrase, che tempo che fa, which generally means what kind of weather are we going to have? But it is also the title of the country's most watched nighttime talk show. And in that sense, it kind of means just generally what's going on. And on Sunday night, Pope Francis was the prime time guest on this particular talk show. We will break down what the Pope had to say in his latest blockbuster interview and what to make of it all. That and more is waiting for you on this episode of Last Week in the Church. So please, do not go anywhere, do not click away, do not change that dial, because we will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial, because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't. That certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever and it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode, which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures, and we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are, they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, 
These people are the absolute level best. So check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. All right, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, January 16th in the new year of our Lord, 2024. As ever, we had a very busy last seven days on the Vatican Beat. We begin this week, as we teased at the top of the show, with more furor over fiducia. The reference, of course, there being to fiducia supplicans, the uber-controversial, the hyper-controversial December 18th document, technically a declaration, issued by the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine and the Faith under Argentinian Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, the gist of which was to authorize, sort of cautiously, but nevertheless, to authorize non-liturgical, non-ritualized blessings of same-sex couples who ask for them. Now, from the moment this document came out prior to Christmas, it has generated, I don't even know what metaphor to use here, an earthquake, an avalanche, a tsunami. I don't know which natural disaster to invoke. But nevertheless, there has been an eruption, let us say, of reactions all around the Catholic world. And that torrent of reaction continued during this past week. So just to break down the latest and greatest, here's what we've got. The Catholic bishops of Africa, as a block, that is, under the umbrella of the Episcopal, the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences of Africa in Madagascar, known by the acronym SACOM, which unites all of the Episcopal Conferences of the African continent. As a group, SACOM put out a statement during this past week, which was signed by Cardinal Fridolin Ambongo of Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, who is the president of SACOM, basically saying, I mean, I guess we could put it as thanks, but no thanks to fiducia supplicans. Essentially, what the African bishop said is, look, we want to reaffirm our complete loyalty to the Pope and to the Holy Father, you know, we want, and to the Vatican, of course, and to the Holy See, you know, we want to acknowledge the wisdom of pastoral concern for the LGBTQ plus community. However, we also want to make it abundantly clear that in the African context, delivering blessings to same-sex couples would be misunderstood it would cause confusion, it would cause kind of a dissolution with regard to the Catholic concept of marriage being between a man and a woman for life. And so for that reason, as a continental block, we are not going to authorize application of fiducia supplicans here. That is, there will be no blessings of same-sex couples in Africa, at least on our watch. That was the gist of the SACOM message. So I really think this is the first time, historically, you have the bishops of an entire continent saying, essentially, we are not going to apply a particular Vatican document here. I mean, in part, this is because we have only had groupings, continental groupings of bishops' conferences since the Second Vatican Council. And so there aren't really many possible parallels to this. But in any event, I do think it is kind of unparalleled. Now, at the same time this past week, you had the Supreme Council of the French Bishops' Conference, that is the kind of governing body of the Bishops' Conference in France, saying that they welcome fiducia supplicans and would apply it as a kind of expression of God's mercy and God's openness to everyone. Now, this came after nine bishops in France had expressed doubts about fiducia supplicans, but at least it would suggest 
that at the corporate level in France, what you have is support for the document. Now, also, this past week, you had a distinguished former Vatican official, and as it happens, an African, Cardinal Robert Sara of Guinea, the former number two official of the Vatican's Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, now the Dicastery for Evangelization, the former head of Cor Unum, which was an erstwhile Vatican department that oversaw the administration of charity around the world, and also the former prefect of the Vatican's Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, which is now the Dicastery, but basically the Vatican's top office for liturgy. So in other words, a Vatican official with a very distinguished pedigree, Cardinal Sara, came out against fiducia supplicans, basically saying that it will cause errors, confusion, disappointment, and scandals, and basically supporting those bishops, particularly in his native Africa, who have indicated they're not going to apply it. So Cardinal Sara, therefore, became another voice indicating what? Resistance? or at least alarm over fiducia supplicans. Also this past week, we saw reactions among priests around the world. So on the one hand, there is an online petition launched by a group of Catholic priests calling for fiducia supplicans to be repealed, which very quickly drew more than 10,000 signatures from Catholic priests around the world, or at least people purporting to be Catholic priests. Of course, it's hard to tell in an online universe, but nevertheless, a large group of priests signed on to this thing. At the same time, an association of married Catholic priests, that is, guys who left the priesthood in order to get married at various points in their careers, have come out in favor of it, indicating their support for fiducia supercans. And finally, there were two different occasions where Pope Francis himself commented this past week. On Saturday, January 13th, he had a meeting with priests from the Diocese of Rome in which he was asked about fiducia supplicans and basically said, what we're doing here is blessing individuals, not organizations. So he said, you know, if they're gay rights movements, we're not going to give our blessing to them, but we will give our blessing to individuals. And then, in this interview that I mentioned at the top of the show on a primetime Italian television program, he was also asked about it and basically said, look, the church cannot start with rejecting people. We always start by embracing them. Then once we've blessed them, we will invite them to consider what the implications of that blessing are in terms of how they live their lives going forward. But in any event, our point of departure has to be to bless everyone. That's essentially what the Pope said. What does all this tell us? Well, what I think it tells us is that the aftershocks of fiducia supplicans continue. And while the Pope and his advisors are not backing down, they are well aware of the strong reactions the document has generated and are trying to navigate how to deal with all of that going forward. Obviously, we will continue to follow it. All right. Second up this week, a year of yellow, that is, a year in which a classic Vatican mystery story is once again going to be front and center. So the 1983 disappearance of a 15-year-old girl by the name of Emanuela Orlandi, whose father was a clerk in the office of the prefecture of the papal household, and whose family lived in an apartment on Vatican grounds. It has gone on over the 40 years since it happened. This case has become basically the Vatican's version of the Kennedy assassination. That is, it is the mother of all mysteries. It is a magnet for alleged new plot twists and the most bizarre cast of characters you can imagine and conspiracy theories of every strait. And Most recently, all of this was sort of brought to the fore by a four-part Netflix series called Vatican Girl, which enjoyed enormous success here in Italy and, you know, got good numbers 
around the rest of the world. But here in Italy, the popular pressure created by this Netflix series has led, among other things, to the fact that the Italian parliament, that is the lower house, the chamber of deputies, and also the Italian senate jointly, have decided to create a new parliamentary inquest of the case both of Emanuela Orlandi and another 15-year-old girl here in Italy who disappeared at basically the same time by the name of Marilla Gregory. Both of their disappearances have been a staple of Italian journalism and speculation and conversation and so on. Anyway, the Italian parliament has created parliamentary inquest of these two cases, which is currently getting organized and is expected to begin its work in February. It will have an annual budget of about $50,000, and it has to deliver, its mandate will end with the current legislature. Now, the current legislature in Italy has to expire by December 2027. However, in Italy, the idea that government is going to endure its full five-year term is pretty unusual. It is kind of anybody's bet when this government might fall and when parliament would be dissolved, therefore. But in any event, the point is the clock is ticking in terms of how long this commission has to do its work. Now, what all this means is that the Orlandi case is once again going to be in the news over the course of 2024, because there is a parliamentary commission with a limited amount of time to make hay out of all of this, which will be conducting hearings and issuing subpoenas and engaging in the kind of grandstanding that these sorts of political investigations always do. One of the members of this commission, an Italian parliamentarian and politician by the name of Carlo Calenda, has already made it very clear that he intends to use this commission to try to hold the Vatican accountable. In the meantime, Emanuela Orlandi's brother, Pietro, this past Saturday, held his annual sit-in on the occasion of his sister's birthday because if Emanuela Orlandi somehow is still alive, she would have turned 56 this past Sunday. My point is, all indications are that like you know, with the Kennedy assassination in the United States, here in Italy, we are set for another cycle in which the Vatican girl saga is going to be at the forefront of popular consciousness and very much in the news as the year progresses. We will, of course, follow how all of this plays out. All right, third up this week, the Pope and Pope. So a new Gallup survey in the United States has confirmed that basically Pope Francis remains a pretty popular figure in the United States. It found that 58% of Americans overall have a favorable view of the Pope. And let me remind you that the most plausible scenario right now is that in November of this year, we are going to have a presidential election pitting two candidates is Donald Trump and Joe Biden against one another, both of whom do not have favorability ratings in excess of 50%. So, you know, in that context, the Pope is not doing so bad. And among American Catholics, he's got a favorability rating of about 77%. And, you know, in my experience, the American Catholic Church is so divided, it is hard to get three quarters of American Catholics to agree on what day of the week it is. In that context, the fact that 77% of them would still say they like the Pope, again, you would have to say that's not so bad. However, all of this is not new because Americans and American Catholics generally have liked popes since the beginning of public opinion surveys. You know, John the 23rd had good numbers. Paul the 6th had good numbers. John Paul the 2nd had very high numbers. Even Benedict the 16th, despite his difficulties, had good numbers. So the fact that Pope Francis has good numbers really is not a revelation. I suppose the headline out of this particular poll would have to be not the Pope's favorable ratings, but his unfavorable 
ratings. Because what the Gallup survey also found is that 30% of Americans now say they have an unfavorable view of Pope Francis. That is up from 10% in 2013 when he was elected, and it is an all-time high for this pope. It's close to the all-time high of 35% of Americans who said they had an unfavorable view of Pope Benedict in 2010. And among American Catholics, the percentage who say they have an unfavorable view of the pope is at 17%, which may not seem very high, but bear in mind it was 5% in 2013. So again, it is a new all-time high in the arc of this particular papacy. What does all this tell us? Well, probably nothing particularly surprising, except that American opinion, and therefore American Catholic opinion, is badly fractured along ideological lines. Basically, if you are a self-described liberal, you are likely to have a very high opinion of this pope. If you were a self-described conservative, you were likely to have a more tepid view of this pope. And if you're a self-described moderate, you will be somewhere in the middle. In other words, Pope Francis is not a pope about whom opinion surmounts polarization. He is instead a pope about whom opinion reflects polarization. And that is a hard truth that I think has been clear for a long time. But this new Gallup survey, nevertheless, I think, drives it home. All right. Finally, this week, we have wither the weather. In other words, the Pope's appearance on the popular Italian evening talk show, Che Tempo Che Fa, which basically literally means, what's the weather like? but in the context of the show means more like kind of what's going on, what's the situation. And as I say, it used to be on the Italian national broadcaster Rai. It's now on a new streaming platform called Nove or Nine, part of the Discovery universe, but nevertheless remains a very popular primetime show here in Italy. And the Pope was once again a guest on this show Sunday evening. I suppose the top note would be it was a live connection from the Pope's residence at the Santa Marta residence in the Vatican. And he was on air for almost an hour. And his energy level and his engagement was quite remarkable for a Pope who was 87 years old, who has had a series of health issues. And so I suppose the place to start would simply to be, it was another confirmation that this pope, you know, despite his struggles, nevertheless seems basically good to go. In terms of what he had to say, aside from his comments on Fiducia Supplicans, the document on blessing same-sex unions that we've already noted, I suppose there would be four top notes. One, and by the way, all of this basically repeating things he has already said. So the news is not what he said, but basically that he has confirmed his position on these points. Number one, in terms of papal resignation, Francis said, look, this is an option that is open to every pope. But right now, I'm not thinking about it. I'm not worrying about it. It is not at the center of my thoughts for the moment. I believe I continue to have the capacity to go forward, and so that's what I'm going to do. He said, if and when a moment arrives that I feel I no longer have the strength to continue, I'll think about it then. But basically the point is, that moment is not now. So the Pope has confirmed that he is not thinking about resignation at the moment, that he actually continues to feel that he still has the capacity, both physical and psychological and spiritual and so on, to continue leading the church. So, resignation off the table for the moment. Second note would be trips. In 2024, the Pope has confirmed that he is planning to visit Polynesia in August. He has already announced he has plans to go to Belgium in September. And later in the year, he continues to want to make his long-awaited homecoming to his native country of Argentina. 
and so whatever his physical struggles may be, he is continuing to plan for and anticipate at least those three trips in 2024. Obviously, the Pope addressed the hot button issues of the moment, which would be the continuing conflicts in both Ukraine and also in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas, saying that all of this is part of a kind of third world war in pieces, and reiterated his strong condemnation of the arms trade, saying often these sorts of conflicts are stoked by arms merchants who are basically looking for an opportunity to try out their new weapon systems on the ground and who are therefore dependent upon fresh conflicts to demonstrate the effectiveness of the merchandise that they are trying to peddle. The Pope, in particular with Ukraine, talked about a recent meeting with Ukrainian youth and how distressed he was to see that these youth seem to have lost their smile, seem to have lost their joy, and said, when any time young people don't exude joy, that's a crime and it's a problem, and indicated, therefore, his continuing commitment to trying to do whatever he can to bring these conflicts to an end. And finally, in this interview, the Pope was asked about God's mercy and basically expressed what he described as not a dogmatic declaration, but a personal hope that hell is empty. That is, that no one has been definitively and eternally excluded from the circle of God's love and God's mercy. And again, the Pope said, I am not, you know, issuing this as a new article of faith, but merely expressing the personal hope that this is the case. You will be, you can find full coverage, by the way, of the Pope's interview and all of the other stories we have talked about this week on the Crux site, which is cruxnow.com. Cruxnow.com, your one stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. By the way, when you're on the site, you will find a handy dandy and very user friendly opportunity to make a donation to Crux. If you could find your way clear to do that, to support not simply this show, but the kind of journalism we bring to you on the Crux site on a regular basis we would be eternally grateful. By the way, once more this week, I am rocking my new Mongolian cashmere that was picked out for me by my wife, Elise, during our recent holiday sojourn in Ulan Batar. If you would prove of my sartorial splendor once again this week, like last week, the credit is not mine. It is Elise's, and I would suggest you find an opportunity to make your approval clear. All right, that is our show for this week. We will be back here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will talk to you again very, very soon.